So you were COO of Etsy. Yes, I was. And then went on to take this Herculean task of turning around Blue Apron. How did you feel about it at the time when you came in in April? Well, actually, I saw a lot of parallels. I mean, I tend to take positions that I believe strongly in the product, and I see a huge opportunity for growth that's untapped. And so there's a lot of similarities between when I joined Etsy and, and also joining Blue Apron. But for me, it's really about we have an amazing quality product. There's been a ton of work done on the foundation of the business behind the, the, the financials as well as the operational structure. And so all of that is a really great platform to think about growth. How, what happened here? I mean, how did this go to, from a unicorn to a microcap? Well, honestly, I think a few, of, a few of the things that we could have done a little bit better and that we're actually now focused on with the new strategy really revolve around three key areas. You know, how do we expand the audience and really attract more people that are going to be great customers for Blue Apron rather than going for broad, really, really, um, you know, high, high expenditure growth, which is a lot of companies are doing this right now, which is growth at all costs. We're, we're moving away from that and really focusing on our most efficient marketing. We're within 12 months of payback and everything is going really well on how we can scale that. And then I think the second piece of it is really about the product itself. There's a lot more that we can do to evolve the product to today's needs. More healthy offerings, more choice. We just launched our first pilot in California that's actually going to offer more recipe options across both healthy and indulgent um, menus, which is what our customers have been asking for for a really long time. And then I think the final piece is about how can we actually use partnerships and larger scale marketing efforts to, um, to get more high affinity customers that are going to be with us for a really long time. It's already paying off. Does the menu option need to get simpler, right? Because one of the early complaints we heard was that the recipes were complex. Yeah. I think actually it's funny because this is actually luckily something we've already solved. So now 50% of our recipes are below 30 minutes to prepare. They're, they're simpler. We're testing them with a variety of types of skilled cooks and people who are more novice cooks to make sure they're really easy and accessible. But for us, it's about how do we actually start with those fresh whole ingredients and give people easier ways to cook. And growth targets, how do they change as a result of all this? So for us, we're thinking about um, how can we set ourselves up? So we said in 2018 that 2019 was really going to be a year of buckling down. We would see continued sort of softening in the customer base over that time while we prepared for, for going forward. And really, we're on track for thinking about growth in 2020. We announced this in our Q2 earnings, and that's what we're aiming for. What has the customer picture looked like? I mean, as the company has struggled over the last two years, how many customers have you lost? And how do you turn that around? So for us, it was really about, again, moving away from this, this concept of just throwing a lot of dollars at um, customers that weren't necessarily going to retain in the funnel. Very common like in the Are industry. Are you talking about the grocery store? No, no, no. Actually, or? more about really, um, if you look across the industry, there's a lot of just ROI negative marketing where you're just really filling the top of the funnel with discounts. And instead, what we're focused on now is how do we create value for our best customers that are going to stay with us for a long time? When you think about those metrics and when you look at the TAM that we've actually set forward, we think we have a TAM of about $45 billion um, looking in the U.S. right now. The addressable and that's, market. Yeah, the addressable market is, is really strong. And part of the reason we think this is strong is because you look at Meal kit purchases, people purchase around 15 times per year with a $58 average order value. That's a strong business when you think about scaling that as long as you're focused on those best customers. So that's what we're looking at is how do we acquire and retain those customers and give them a product that's going to keep them around for a really long time. Do people still want to cook at home? I mean, I look at the restaurant stocks, Yum, McDonald's, restaurant brands. They're all trading near record highs. I wonder if there's been any shift in consumer behavior. I think there's a few things that you're seeing, and the reality is we're seeing that 82% of meals are sourced from the home. That's up from a decade ago. You are seeing changes in spending when it comes to spending in the home versus out of the home, but that's not actually because people are eating out more. It's because it's more expensive to eat out than it used to be. So actually more people are cooking at home now than ever before. And even when you look at takeout and other options, you're not going to get the flavor, you're not going to get the quality, and it's going to cost you a lot more with all the delivery fees and everything involved. So you think uh, on the margin you're taking share from other meal kit services, other restaurants, grocery stores, what, which we at the top of that a, list? Yeah, we see it as a variety because what we hear from our customers and what they love about the product, it's just the experience of cooking together with their loved ones, with their family, teaching their kids how to cook. It's fun. Right. So we're seeing some share taken from traditional just cooking at home, maybe from the grocery store, some from takeout, and some from eating out because they find it a bit more of a relaxing evening to stay home. You're seeing more and more people wanting to stay home.
Have you had a tough time talking to investors and trying to get them to buy in after the big fall? I think the reality is we're in such an interesting space. I mean, the reality is we're in the food space. We removed the decision making of what am I going to have for dinner tonight, which frankly is really painful, more painful than going to the grocery store for a lot of people. It's that decision fatigue. We all have so many things to think about during the day, but you also want it to be good. And our recipes, our ingredients, our culinary authority, our brand recognition is by far still number one. So we feel confident that when we're talking to investors, they appreciate and understand that there's something here. It's really just about getting execution right and making sure that we're actually capitalizing on that. Kevin O'Leary was a big fan of, your, fan of yours. Yeah. Uh, and the Power Lunch stock draft, he chose you. He thought you were going to get bought <laughs> because you were cheap and, and in a hot space. I mean, I wondered, is, is it still that kind of environment in meal kit delivery? Where there's I think for us, what we're like really that? focused on is we think we have a long-term sustainable business. We just need to ex execute on it. And that's really where we're focused.